All right, we are continuing with chapter six of Self as God, of Thesis on God, sorry. Uh, chapter is Self as God. Any questions or clarifications before we pick up with the text? All right, so we finished last time with this section, Ego and I. So let's just do a little recap just to establish the flow of thought. He says, the ego is created when the self is associated with the body, mind, and intellect. The self, identifying with the body, becomes the perceiver actor. Identifying with the mind becomes a feeler and with the intellect, a thinker. All right, so this is, we were touching on this last time. So the ego is the belief that we have that I am this body, this mind, and this intellect. And if we need to look for evidence that I have this belief, all I need to do is to look at the statements that I make. I am warm, I am cold. And that's obviously referring to the body. But I don't say the body is warm or cold, I say I am warm or cold. Which indicates that I believe I am my body. I am happy or sad. Again, I don't say the mind is going through happiness or sadness, I say I am that. So there is intrinsic in these statements the belief that I am the body, the mind and the intellect. So we don't know that we're asserting the ego with all of our statements, and yet we are. But what's also interesting is that when we make statements like I am anything, we're also asserting the I, which we're considering here to be the real self. The thing that is happy is not the thing that is warm. It's the mind that's happy, it's the body that's warm. And yet, we say that they are the same thing, which we label as I. So when we start to analyze our experiences this way, what we can see is that we're pointing to something which pervades all of our experiences, warmth, happiness, understanding, and yet at the same time is separate from it. So if you like, there are four things going on here. You've got your physical experiences, your emotional experiences, your intellectual experiences, and the I that somehow ties them all together. It's a separate thing from those experiences, and we can say that that makes sense because we're attributing those experiences to the I. It's the thing that body, mind, and intellect are connected to, or as he puts it, related to, or associated with. So the I is associated with the body, mind, and intellect. This association of I and body, mind, intellect is the ego. The I exists separate and distinct from our experiences as unrelated consciousness. That's what he's talking about here. So he says it is that unchanging, ever-present I which is the Supreme Self declared as God. So the Supreme Self as opposed to a unsupreme self, non-supreme self, lower grade self, however you want to think about it. The self with a lowercase s refers to the personality that we have. The, the roles that we're playing. It doesn't essentially define you. It's not your essential self. It's the I, the unrelated consciousness that is the essence of your experience. So he finished off there last time. He continues on. He says, I am is the immaculate self within. The problem humans face is that they are unable to hold the I am without qualifying, modifying it. Thus do they state, I am rich, I am poor, I am tall, I am short, I am happy, I am unhappy, I am honoured, I am dishonoured, etc. Never does one remain with I am per se. The pure I, without qualification, modification, is the supreme self, is God. So in this section here, he draws on two of the 
were a few of the stories from the Old Testament. So in Exodus, you have Moses on Mount Sinai, and he sees the burning bush. He goes over to it to investigate, and hears the voice of God. God says to him, take your sandals off, you're standing on holy ground. And he speaks to him. And God says that, go to the Israelites and lead them out of Egypt. Lead them out of their bondage. And Moses objects. In fact, he puts about three or four different objections forward. And he says, what if they don't believe me? Or what if they say, who is this God? What's his name? So the Israel so Moses has gone to the Israelites and says, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt. God told me. And they're skeptical, naturally, as they should. But they say, well, what is the name of this God? And the Swami quotes Exodus. He says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are saying to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So there's this idea that the supreme self, the highest version of consciousness is to stay just with that I am. So one of the ways you can look at this is to say that it's providing the place to look for God. Where will you look for God if you want to find it? We all are intimately connected with that sense of I am. In fact, it's so ubiquitous, it's so much part of our experience that we completely miss it, even when we're saying it. I'm late, I'm happy, I'm whatever. We are focusing more on the qualities and the properties of the experience, the contents of consciousness, and we're missing out on the thing that is its basis. We used this example last time. If you imagine an actor, an actor can play many, many roles. But the thing that is necessary for those characters to be portrayed is the actor herself. She is the base. She's the center, she's the axle around which all these characters revolve. Without her, without the actor, nothing comes to fruition. Nothing comes to existence. And yet when we're watching her on the stage, we don't think of her as the actor, we don't think of her as the person. We see the character and we're absorbed in that. In a similar way, we're, we have these characteristics, we have these roles that we play. We are stuck with the, the contents of consciousness, the self with the lowercase s, and we miss the thing that makes them possible, the center from which they evolve. But we have, as human beings, this ability to shift our attention onto this fourth aspect, away from the body, the mind, the intellect, and onto that sense of I am. And so that provides the place to start looking and investigating and inquiring. What is this I? What's its role? What's its function? Why is it there? Where does it come from? In one of the other texts, he says, hold on to that thought at all costs. So this is the first of the aspects that he touches on here. The second aspect starts to describe a little bit more around why. Why make this shift of attention? And so it's in the next chapter of the same book, Exodus, it's another objection from Moses. And he says, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe that I was sent by God? Okay, I've given them your name, I am that I am, but what if they don't follow me? He says, what do you got in your hand there? He says, it's a staff. He says, throw it to the ground. So he throws it to the ground. And it turns into a serpent. He says, pick it up. And so Moses picks it up, and it turns 
back into the staff. So he says, so Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Further down the track in the text, Moses uses that staff to, to perform miracles. Taps the rock, water comes out, parts the Red Sea, etc. So what's the relevance here? The serpent represents the ego. You see a similar thing in the story of the Garden of Eden. It's the serpent that tempts Eve, surely you will not die, to eat the apple that was forbidden. So the serpent represents the ego, and he's saying here, grasp it, take hold of it. So what does it mean to grasp the ego, to take hold of it? If we think about the, the way we talk about concepts, this is a very difficult concept to grasp. So when we talk about grasping the ego, it means grasping it with the intellect. Or rather, probably more correctly, grasping it with the mind and intellect, having that confluence. So it means seeing it for what it is. The moment you see the ego for what it is, it vanishes because it's not real. It's a lie. We see a similar thing when we are doing our own self-reflection and trying to overcome barriers in our life. We have stories that we tell ourselves about who we are, about how the world works, about what life is like. Oh, I'm not very good at that. It's, it's not something I'm good at. It's a belief I hold. These beliefs that are false have their strength in influencing our behavior and our lives because they go unquestioned. But the moment you start to question your beliefs, really look at them, many of them just fall away. You see it for what it is. It's a lie. So to grasp the ego is to really look at this belief. Am I my body, my mind, my intellect? Am I more than that? It's very difficult to say, no, I'm not my body, mind, or intellect. I mean, it's easy to say. It's, it's hard to really grasp that idea. Perhaps one way to edge into that idea is to say, am I only my body, mind, and intellect, or am I more than that? Am I defined entirely by the physical, emotional, and intellectual? Or is there something else? So we're questioning the ego. We are looking at it. We do the same thing when we make a conscious choice for the better. When we make the choice that our conscience knows is the right one. To choose the conscience often means to go against the ego. And take a really simple example. You are at a dinner and someone's brought out dessert. You have a piece, you enjoy it, you love it, you want another one. So you have another small piece, second helping, that's fine. You want another one. You want a third piece. You know you shouldn't because sugar. The moment you disconnect and say, no, I really am looking after my health. I'm prioritizing my health. What have you done? You've disconnected from that part of your personality, from that specific desire. You can only do that when you are fully aware of it, when you are looking at it, witnessing it. If you're caught up in that desire, then the desire decides for you. Piece number three, and then you hide a piece in your jacket and take it home. The idea is that by making the choice away from ego, you're moving towards the healthier. But implicit in being able to make that choice is that you are witnessing the desire. You're aware of it. My mind, my body wants me to have yet another piece, but I'm going to say no. You're grasping the ego, you're seeing it for what it is. 
So, so what? Go back to the story. When he grasps the snake, it turns into that staff. It returns back to the staff, but it becomes or it develops the power to create miracles. So when we grasp the ego, or rather when the ego vanishes, we become miraculous in a sense, which he describes as omnipotence or omniscience and omniscience. So omnipotent, omniscient, let's understand what we mean by this, importantly what we don't mean by this. Omnipotent doesn't mean all-powerful in the sense that you can lift a car up above your head now or that you can use Jedi mind tricks to you know, force people to do things. It's not power in that sense. Let's go back to the example of the waker and the dreamer. When you are in the dream, there is the dream world. The sky and the birds and the mountains in the distance, the, the land in front of you, the cities, the trees, the people, activities going on. Where does it all come from? What's the, the vitalizing power? What's the, the material that it's made out of? Well, it's the waker's mind. Everything in the dream comes from your mind in terms of the creativity of it, in terms of the substance of it. So with regards to your dream world and your dream experience, your mind is all-powerful. It's the all-powerful creator of your dream. In a similar way, when the ego vanishes and you identify as that underlying consciousness, you recognize yourself as the source of all experience. All conditioned consciousness, all experience, arises from the unconditioned consciousness, in the same way that the dream arises from the mind. When you become the very source of it, you become all-powerful in that sense, all-creative. And the other word he uses here is omniscient. So again, it doesn't mean that if you ask a self-realized person you know, something about quantum physics that she can rattle it off, or what's the capital of Norway, or start speaking in Swahili. It doesn't mean that. This is intelligence. This is stuff that you can pick up from external sources. Omniscient, or knowing, means that you become the knowing principle. How is it that you are able to know anything? Or to put it another way, how is it that you're able to have an experience? All experiences are conscious of. When you say I'm experiencing warmth, you say I'm conscious of warmth in the body. When you're having a happy experience, I'm conscious of happiness. We don't say that. We don't say, oh, I'm conscious of being happy to meet you. No, I'm happy to meet you. But it's, despite the fact that we don't say it, all experience is the nature of being conscious of the object. To become omniscient means that you trace back to the very source of that consciousness, the source of knowledge. And so we are liberated from that state of being the created and we become the creator. We're liberated from that state of being constrained by the contents of consciousness and now being the source of consciousness. And again, the whole idea is a shift of our attention off the thing that we're experiencing and onto what enables us to experience it, what's at the center of the experience, 
not the periphery that I am. Okay, any questions to any of that before we move on? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know we've got experiences like um, I want the piece of cake. There's the mind functioning. You have experiences of saying I am hot, I am cold. There's the intellect functioning. Yeah, you know, it's making that distinction between the opposites. How do you bring consciousness with a capital C into this? The the short answer to the question is that's really for you to decide. That's for you to figure out but it comes from an understanding of the principles. So the, the principle is that in order for me to have an experience at all, there is an underlying consciousness or knowing principle or experiencing principle. Where does the dream exist? Where is it? What's the space in which the dream arises? You can say, well, it's the space, I guess, of my own mind. Very good. That makes sense. Now you're here in the waking state. And it's very like a dream in the sense that there are perceptions, emotions, and thoughts going on. There seems to be this spatial dimension. There's something here and over there. And what does this experience exist? What's it arising in? Take all of the states of consciousness. Waking, dream, and deep sleep, cycling around. What do they arise in? What's the space in which they play, enabling them to be experienced? There again, the answer is consciousness. So in terms of how do you bring this sense of consciousness into your experiences, you first of all need to understand the basic idea of it, and then... It's a matter of working into your experiences that reflection question that brings you back. So you might say, how am I capable of having this experience? I desire another piece of cake. How do I know I desire it? Well, because I can feel it. What enables you to feel it? Well, it's just there. Yeah, but how do you know it's there? because I know it. What is that knowing principle? So I guess what I'm saying is that we're looking to trace back to the thing which is clearly present. It, it's clearly present that you are aware of wanting that extra piece of cake. But how do you know that you want it? Who is the one that wants it? Well, it's my body that wants it, or you could say it's my mind that wants it. That message, have another piece of cake, who's it being delivered to? You could say, well, it's being delivered to my own mind from my body. Okay, that awareness in the mind that I want cake, who's that being delivered to? Who's the ultimate recipient of of the experiences that makes them known. It is me. So what you're looking to get to is not the answer to a question. What you're looking to get to is to that connection back to the subjectively felt sense of being the one at the center of your experiences. And when you ask the question, how am I able to experience it? Oh, because of pure consciousness. You're still in what you might call objective awareness. It's a bit of an unfortunate term because we use the word objective in another context. But when I say objective awareness, it's stuff in consciousness. It's the contents of the mind that, that we're still stuck in when we say, oh, what enables me to feel consciousness it's just like a student giving a memorized answer to the teacher the teacher says you know prove Pythagoras's theorem and so she gets up on the board and just puts the letters and the numbers in the right place and hey there you go there's proof but she doesn't understand it 
she hasn't really connected with what it means. It's just repeating what she knows. In a similar way, what enables me to feel, think, and perceive? Oh, consciousness. You're just giving yourself the answer that you know is right, but you haven't connected with it. So you're looking to connect with that sense of I. It's not a, it's not, it's not there in language. It's not an emotion. It's not a perception. You could say that it borrows from all of those, but when you see it, you return back to something. You have a sense of, aha, something has been connected to. What are you, what are you connecting to? That sense of being the subject of all of your experiences. So, how do you draw that sense of consciousness into your daily experiences? By creating for yourself the question or the reflection pathway that reconnects you back to the sense of I am. It's a little bit like, just to continue the analogy, let's stay with the cake example. You could get yourself to a point where you know, the, the cake's in front of you, you say, oh, am I going to have another piece of cake? No, I'm, I'm looking after my health. And so you don't eat the cake. And then later you go home and have four Mars bars. What happened? When you said no to the cake, you didn't connect with your goal of health. You just repeated some words to yourself. Like a positive affirmation, I am healthy. I am looking after my health. They're just words. Next time you go out, same thing happens. There's the cake there. You say, no, I'm looking after my health. But this time it's different. This time you connect to the reality of that goal. It has meaning for you. And so when you say no this time, it's effective regulation. Previous time meant nothing. You just suppressed the desire. Second time around, you really connected with your goal of physical health and it felt different. So compare those two experiences. If you've never had them, you know, change the analogy to, to fit. The second time, there is a sense of connecting with something. There's almost like an aha moment and something changes something is different the first time around i still wanted it i just said no and turned away in a similar way in terms of bringing the consciousness into our experiences that's what you're looking for you're looking for that sense of a shift of actual meaning of something new being added to the experience not just words and so it highlights again the importance of spending some time and attention in the study and the practice of these ideas because when you're out in the world barrage of perceptions coming in, lava flow of emotions and thoughts reacting as a result, it can be difficult to reconnect. So you practice where it's easier. So you sit in your morning study session and think about this idea. What is, what is this I am that, that I keep hearing about? Can I find it? I'm sitting, in, I'm sitting on the floor, it's cold this morning. I, I am cold, let's use that one, I am cold. I'm also confused, all right? I'm cold and confused. Is the thing that's cold the thing that's confused? No. Why are they equated to the same thing? What is this the same thing? Who is experiencing this? 
what's the space in which all this arises start to reflect and at some point you'll tease out that sense of I am you'll connect with it there'll be a sense of aha there'll be a sense of expansion perhaps it'll be different for everyone but the idea is that you'll know it when you see it that there's a sense of I am distinct and separate from the contents of consciousness when you've grasped that stay with it become acquainted with it and whatever pathway you used to get there that may be the one that you continue to use elsewhere and what's interesting is that the one that is meaningful and purposeful for you might land completely flat for everybody else so you might have the question to whom are these experiences delivered and boom you get that sense of I am ah aha and all excited you, you know, speak to your friends who are also interested in this subject just ask yourself the question to whom are these experiences delivered and you're all you know, you're full of enthusiasm this is going to work and they ask the question and nothing happens and I think she's deluded it is a very personal journey in that regard now the questions that we have been talking about around this subject are very powerful and generally whatever question does work for you it'll be similar to many other questions that you would have heard but it is important that you find what works for you understand the general principle from others and from texts from outside of yourself but really how do you bring it in base it on the knowledge and then make the practice your own wanting credit for your actions you can consider ego again it, you want to be a little bit careful anytime you grasp for more than you need it's ego it's ego functioning and so the example you gave you know okay that friend was the one who requested the photo be taken didn't get the credit do you need the credit no i don't need the credit and that's what i was touching on with this idea of just grasping the ego if you ask that question it's quite a good example you know i i was the one who requested that photo be taken and no one's you know brought me into the equation and yeah do i need the credit you know the ego functions as that that what about me it makes me primary it puts me in a privileged position rather than seeing things as they are which is that there are you know a dozen people involved in this one interaction and they're all necessary for it to take place but I privilege my position same thing happens with inferiority complex and we've talked about this at length which is that I make myself a special case when the truth is that I'm not oh I I'm no good I I shouldn't do that I'm not very clever blah 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 no 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 don't give me thanks for this in fact let's stay with your example you know let's say the person um, who requested the photo be taken imagine she was brought into the equation and someone said oh but it was so-and-so who made the request for this so yeah some credit must go to her if she says no 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 I, I, I don't I can't no, please please I'm very uncomfortable receiving that kind of praise and credit that's also the ego so um, you're treating yourself as a special case and why that's wrong is that it, it doesn't reflect the reality the reality is that you know there is this uh, network of action reaction choice being made by all of us all the time from this point as far back as you wish to conceive and that's what's brought the present moment in and we forget that massive massive network of karma that massive network of choice and action cause and effect and only focus on one aspect of it my action that's how the ego is functioning one of the problems with this idea is that it can be misappropriated or it can be wrongly understood and we 
don't give ourselves what we do need. The body, mind, and intellect have their needs. Body, of course, has its need for you know food, water, sleep, safety, shelter. If you say to yourself, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to drink any water. I don't need water. That, that's fine. You're not giving yourself what you need. So too, the emotional side of the personality needs connection. It needs relatedness to other beings, to other humans. We need a sense of competence and so on. So there are things that we actually do need. And so when we talk about the ego being taking more than you need, part of the problem is that we may wrongly identify what we do and don't need, and so we actually starve ourselves of what we need. So it could be that I do need connections, I do need to reach out. Um, so that's why it's important to always look at the two sides of that coin in terms of inferiority, superiority. Because anytime we take more than we need, it's ego, but also anytime we don't take what we need, it's ego. If we refuse to accept something that is natural for us, it's also ego. And refusing to accept praise is a good example. The inability to accept praise. If someone says that was really beautiful, thank you. Just say thank you and move on. Yeah, I've been practicing for years. I'm thank you for noticing. I've been practicing my photography. So both sides of it. Yeah, so that's another way to think about the ego, which is to say that it's that loss of perspective. And so to step aside from the ego, to, to rise above the ego, is to get that perspective. In fact, that's an interesting phrase. To rise above the ego means you get that perspective. The Swami often uses the analogy of being in a maze. Now, when you're in the maze, the labyrinth, you, you don't know where to go. But if you are just a few feet above the maze, now you can see the whole thing. So again, rising above your experience gives you perspective. And how do you rise above your experiences? You go back to the, to the principles that you know and you, you reconnect back to them using that reflection pathway that works for you. And you know, so that's so that's one way through the, the conceptual path, if you want to put it that way. And the other way through is through the service path. Just simply ask the question, what can I offer here in this situation? What's something I can offer to the person, to the group, to the environment, to the situation here? The moment you say, What can I offer, what can I give to the environment, you're again rising above the ego which tends to want to grasp and hold for itself. So connecting to higher thoughts and connecting to a service ideal, these are both ways of rising above the ego. Uh, so another question coming here, how do we distinguish need from want slash desire? is need for survival only. Need isn't only for survival in the sense of physical survival. You can think of need in the same way that you would for any gadget. All right, You take your phone. It won't operate as a phone unless the battery is charged. So you need to have a charged battery in order for your phone to operate. You need to have petrol in your vehicle and oil. You need to have etc. So what are you as a human being? What's your, what's your function? What do you do? What does it mean to be a fully functioning human being? Okay, you can answer that question for yourself. Anything that needs to be connected into the gadget, if you want to put it that way, in order for you to function as a human being, those are your needs. So what happens if you don't have a sense of autonomy? What happens if you don't have connection and relatedness? What happens if you don't have competence and appropriate goals? 
what happens if you don't have a higher ideal? You can't really function fully as a human being. Okay, you're doing the basics, you're getting up, you're going to work, you're going to sleep, you're feeding yourself, but that's not the life of a human being. That's the life of a robot. So the idea of a need is it is those nutrients, if you want to put it that way, necessary for you to flourish as a human being. Uh, so how do you distinguish needs from wants or desires? Again, that's your own reflection. First of all, understand conceptually the difference. Well, what is a need? Okay, that's that, that. What is a desire? Are they opposites? Are they related? How are they related? They're not strictly opposites, but they're definitely related. The things that you need, you'll also feel a desire for. I need autonomy, relatedness, competence, and an ideal. I need these things. I also have a desire for them. What does my desire for autonomy look like? How does it express? My desire for connectedness, my desire for competence, my desire for meaning and purpose. What do, what do those desires look like? So they are related. How do you distinguish need from want? Start with where you are dissatisfied. And look for the desire that is being unmet. And then ask the question, is this a need? What happens if I don't have this thing that I desire? Can I function without it? Okay, can I function without food, water, sleep, and shelter? No. Pretty easy. Can I function without connection, without feeling part of a group? I mean, I can get up and go to work and do my stuff, but does that mean I'm functioning as a human being? You might decide no. No, that's not functioning. That's I can't legitimately claim that I'm being a human if I don't have that sense of connection and relatedness to others, etc. So it's for you to decide. What is my function here? And I say here, I mean in my life. What's, what's the point of being alive? What am I supposed to be? And in a very general sense. And then it's a matter of making a decision. If you think something is a need, it's your obligation to fulfill it. Be open to changing your mind. You know, I thought that was something that I really needed. But I look back now, and to be honest, I think that I made that decision because I couldn't have it. I had a single thought, oh, I want that thing. And when I realized I couldn't have it, desire got inflamed, and it seemed much bigger to me than it was, and I really felt like it was a need. And so I moved heaven and earth to get that need fulfilled, and now that I've got it, oh, actually, it's good, but you know, I probably could live without it. Fine. Change your answer. And same thing the other way around. No, no, I don't need this. It's just the ego's desire. Okay, so live without it for a while. Happy? No. There's still something missing. So don't expect to get it right on the first go, or the second, or the third. In fact, getting it right is less important than trying to get it right. Upanishad pronounces the reality. He says, Kyun Upanishad is one of the Upanishads in the Vedas, the ancient scriptural texts of India. The Upanishad presents a vivid picture of the supreme reality as the self within. Therein, an enlightened master imparts the knowledge of God to an evolved seeker yearning to receive it. The Upanishad commences with the question put forward by the disciple to the master. Okay, so let's have a look. 
So in the Kena Upanishad, the student is essentially asking, what is it that enables experience? What enables the body, mind, and intellect to function? Uh, he's asking for that source of experience. So the way he actually phrases it, he says, by whom willed and directed does the mind alight on objects? Endowed by whom does the primeval vital air function? By whom will does speech originate? What spirit indeed directs the eye and ear? So he talks about the mind, the vital ear, speech, eye and ear. So he's essentially covering the entirety of human experience. The mind, obviously, refers to the, that inner dimension of our, our thoughts and our feelings. The vital ear refers to the, the prana, the physiological functions. Speech refers to the organs of action. And eye and ear refer to the organs of perception. So he's encompassing the whole of experience and says, by whom willed and directed does all this occur? From where does it originate? What's the source of experience? And the response that the master gives, he says, that which is indeed the ear of the ear, the mind of the mind, the speech of the speech, the vital ear of the vital ear, and the eye of the eye. Okay, so he repeats the same thing for each of the different elements of the personality. So let's just stay with one because it's the same analysis for all of them. The ear of the ear. So you see here, we've got a capital E and a lowercase e. So the lowercase e ear refers to the ear, the physical thing, the faculty of hearing. He says it is the ear of the ear. So he's essentially talking about what enables us to hear. So if somebody were to ask you the question, what enables you to hear? You might respond with, well, it's my ear. And you point to you know, the thing on the side of your head. Do the thought experiment. What if that was lost? What if you know, that got sliced off somehow? You'd still be able to hear. Why? Well, because all the workings of the middle ear haven't been touched, haven't been destroyed. So really, what enables you to hear? It's not the fleshy thing on the outside. It's that, that middle ear that, that does all the stuff in there. And then, you know, nosy doctor pipes up and says, actually, really, it's that internal ear, the cochlea and all that stuff, and the nerve endings that go to the brain. That's really what enables you to hear. And you can keep on going physiologically in this way. So the question's getting at this idea of what is the actual essence of hearing. If I can lose the fleshy part and still hear, then that's not the essence. If my middle ear is damaged, okay, I can't pick up certain frequencies, certain sounds are a bit muffled to me, but I can still hear, there's still sound. Is it the internal ear? Even if that's damaged, I can still hear. What's the essence of hearing? What is the ear of the ear? So when we talk about an essence, it's from the dictionary, a property of something without which it would not exist or be what it is. So the essence of sugar is sweetness. What is hearing? What is the essence of hearing? But remember he's asking with regards to the entire personality. What is the essence of all perception? What's the essence of all action? Of all physiological functions, of feeling, of thinking? It is the ear which does hearing. But what enables that ear to do that thing? It is the mind that does feeling. It is the intellect that does thinking. 
but what is it that enables those things to do their thing? So the essence of perception is the same thing as the essence of action. It's the same as the essence of feeling and thinking and everything else. So the ear of the ear, it's the very essence of hearing, is the source. What's interesting about this answer is that it is incredibly simple. To say it is the ear of the ear takes a little bit of mental intellectual gymnastics to, to say, well, what does he mean? The ear of the body is the thing that hears. The ear of the ear is the very essence of that faculty. Oh, okay, I see what he means. It's also the eye of the eye. The essence of hearing is the essence of vision. The essence of emotion, of feeling, is the essence of perception. So we are tying these different experiences together at a nexus, a fundamental point. The student who asks this question has done the preparation. You know, the story around this, not just Kenopanesha, but the story around this kind of mythology is that the student chops their way through the jungle with you know, food and fuel on their back, a you know, bundle of sticks. Finally, they get up to the enlightened master sitting on the rock. So they have put in the, the physical, emotional and intellectual effort to get to a point where when they ask the question, they're not just being given a piece of information. That question reacts with the seeker's mind in such a way as to drive the attention inwards. So the ear of the ear, the eye of the eye, isn't just stacked away as a good piece of information for later on to talk about with his friends. His attention is driven inwards towards that source. There's an aha moment. This Kunapanishad has been taught to thousands of seekers. How many of them have become self-realized as a result? This goes back to the earlier question of how do you bring the, the consciousness into daily experience? Such a simple phrase, such a relatively simple idea, the ear of the ear, my stomach is rumbling. It's the stomach of the stomach. It's the anger of my anger. It's the sadness of my sadness. It's the confusion of my confusion. It's the joy of my joy. It's the essential source. It's the alpha, which is to say it is the source of experience. It is the omega. It's the ultimate recipient of experience. It's how God describes himself again in the Bible. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end of experience. All right. Thanks, folks. Appreciate the discussion and the questions. Uh, so have a great week, everybody. And Hari Om.